What are you doing? Cool. All right. Um. So, sorry I'm late. I was out at uh at the uh, dentist. Um, and then walking the dogs. Uh, I filmed a video of that, which is cool. Um. Uh. What part of the what what part of the review are we up to? Um. I think. Like we done we done the Wicker Man, yeah, Mandy. I think we done Wild at Heart. <sighs> what else was there? Uh we did face off, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that, yeah. That was when I had the shave. Um I mentioned the Wicker Man. We did Ghost Rider, right? Yeah? Cool, okay. A vampire's kiss. Okay, so what Oh, this is the intro! Oh, <laughs> shit, sorry, uh, it's been a bit of a mess of a day. Um, uh, and of course, sorry about the no microphone except for the camera ones, yay. Uh, cool, uh, welcome back, or welcome to, for the first time viewers, I don't know why, why you're watching my content, what are you doing? Um, today I am looking at Nicolas Cage films, part two. Uh, Unleash the Cage, yes, that's right, uh, all those films I just mentioned, all six of them, um, where Cage goes somewhat on a crazy, crazy spree, it's, it's, it's really fun, um, so I <laughs> forgot that I was meant to film this before, uh, I shaved and showered and went out and did everything, so that's an interesting way to start the video, so, uh, I guess we'll just jump right into it with, um, our first review, uh, I think that was Mandy, so, yeah, um, if you haven't seen, there's a part one where I do the all-American cage, the all-American hero, you know, uh, cool, alright, um, uh, let's get started then, or oh, put this clip before the rest of them, have fun. Mmm. This is just getting too much. Way too much. It's like I've been psychologically affected by watching all these movies and it's just kind of... This has happened because of it. But I'm done now. I'm done. I've just got to do my reviews and release it all. So let's let's start by getting rid of this. <sighs> Fucking M. Shit. Face off. Is a uh, nineteen ninety seven film? Maybe that's a good question. Actually, it doesn't matter about release date. Either way, it's a nineties film. Nineties, late nineties. Uh, featuring, of course, our favourite, Nicolas Cage. Can't deny how much we, by this stage, love Nicolas Cage. He's gone through his whole American hero phase and boom, yes, but now he's the ultimate hero and he's f the bad guy at the same time, but not really the hero because the hero is John Travolta, who changes faces with Nicolas Cage's Casper Troy to find out where there's a, meant to be a bomb and then it just kind of, it's a, li it's a little much ah, in terms of plot. Uh, that being said, I have quite my review. Uh, and I feel like given how much I need to get rid of this, you know, it's a, it's a, I like, I like growing a beard. It's uh, long enough. It's like longer than a centimeter. I think that's fine. Need to shave it off. Need to trim it down. Make it uh, sublime. Uh, so my quote for this film is, "If I was to let you suck my tongue, would you be grateful?" Um, yeah, that's a that's a it's <laughs> one of the weirdest lines in the film. Um, so yes, Cage plays Caster Troy. Uh, um, they, what, they even say Elvis left the Don, Elvis Don left the building, so I guess that's kind of like a joke on the fact that, you know, Cage is 
known for his uh, Elvis, imp Elvis impression, which we will cover later in uh, the famous Wild at Heart, where he pretty much is Elvis. Doesn't matter. Um, so Cage is the dual wielding uh, golden gun supervillain who's perverted, creepy, and a million percent crazy. That's a plant. Um, opposite him is John Travolta, aka Sean Archer. Uh, you know, family man, cop whose son is killed during the opening credits by Cage, incidentally, given that Cage was trying to kill Travolta's character. Um, so yes, this famously is the film where Travolta and Cage just, they swap faces. He takes his face off. Um, yeah, because there's a thing that's going to blow up and, and Travolta needs to know where it is and how to stop it. And C Cage's character's brother is the only one who knows. But then it turns out that Cage is, is actually still alive and he wakes up bloody faced and is like, I want a face and sees Travolta's face in a jar and takes it and becomes Travolta, weirdly. Um... The surgery scene in particular, I will admit, is uh, absolutely mental. Um, and is rather horrifying, as well as hilarious because of how weird and stupid it is. But it is, is pretty graphic in its detail. Uh, I'm not going to get my face taken off, that's for sure. Um, so let's, let's talk about Cage as Travolta. So slow and dramatic at first, but happily embraces the craziness of, of Castor Troy, as in when Travolta's character is played by Cage. I don't even know how I wrote this. It's so confusing to talk about in terms of review because like you have Cage is crazy and ridiculous and out there for the first 20, 30 minutes and it's great. And then when he comes back into the film, he is, uh, when he comes back into the film, when he's now actually not Casper Troy, he's John Travolta with Nicolas Cage's face on him, he's now the family man. He's now has the same morals and values as Travolta, but then he has to play himself up. He has to be like, oh shit, I have to mock my previous <coughs> character scene because it's in the script. That's what I have to do. To have to pretend that I am Casper Troy. <coughs> Oh, something got in my throat. Um, so in the latter half of the film, when Archer, now Cage, finds out that Troy is wearing his face, Cage's performance becomes very dramatic, and uh, we still are able to see the dramatic talent that Cage helms, which is uh, actually quite a joy, you know. It's, it's always good to see that kind of stuff. Um, what else do we have? Uh, Travolta as Cage. Uh, just just completely crazy, which kind of sucks, given how most people prefer to see Cage playing crazy, especially nowadays. He's so synonymous with being bad films or crazy acting. Um, and a lot of people prefer to see him like that. And it's like, nope, Travolta gets that performance instead. He gets the overly touchy with the girls. It's kind of, it's the creepy performance, that's what I should say, yeah. Um, overall thoughts on the film. It's one hell of a crazy film. Uh, I think it's a little dull in terms of pacing. I mean, it is like two hours and 20 minutes long. It is long as hell, but this is like the last big 90s blockbuster, so it, it kind of makes sense. Um, uh, the final act is absolutely mental. There was the boat chase, the, the gun chase, the, the Mexican standoff, everything about it. Even if it even is a Mexican standoff, it's, it's a standoff and it's really poorly cut, but then it's like so stylized because it's a John Woo film and there's birds and pigeons and oh, that thing where he does that, it's just, I don't know, it's mental. Um, uh, the first 10 to 15 minutes when Cage plays Casper Troy is amazing as well. It's so over the top and brings you right into pretty much exactly what you're expecting to get from the performances and the directing and the style of this film, especially given that this is John Woo, who's like the, mostly known for his uh, martial arts stuff, uh, Hong Kong crime films. Um, the middle part is weird and, you know, it's somewhat fun. The mm, surgical scene is 
and creepy, um, but then it all feels kind of long and, you know, it, you can feel it, the pacing just drags. Um, so I'm giving it an overall three stars. It's got its fun scenes. I think probably you could arguably say it's a better than three star film. It's probably even a four star film, especially given a lot more of the context of the film. But just me personally watching it, even knowing the context of John Woo and Cage and the film itself and even Travolta, it's just not wholeheartedly my kind of film. 90s action films are fun, but sometimes if they're way too long and just, just, yeah, then, you know, yeah. I'd say it's it's worth watching, definitely. If you've never seen it before, it is pretty fun. And I would definitely suggest it. I'd even suggest John Woo as a director. He's, he's got some good shit. Um, notif notif notable feature, none of the stunt doubles look anything like Cage or Travolta, which is like a strange criticism of the film, but is wholeheartedly a criticism of the film that none of them have the same hairlines or anything. And there are many scenes where they have stunt doubles and it's very obviously not either Cage or Travolta doing the stunts. Uh, now for the fun part, I'm going to stop the recording on my mic because... Um, I'm going to shave this beard off on camera because of fucking why not, I guess. Um, I guess, and I don't want to pick the microphone, so I'm going to use the microphone from the camera that you cannot see. Where is it? It's there. Cool. So like any professional shaver, I have my own shaving kit. In fact, it's, um... Quite a handy dandy with the, the scissors and the big ass comb and the other shaver and the big shaver. It's got the, it's got everything. It's a whole hairdresser's kit. It's great. Um, that being said, given that this is not my bathroom, I'm going to take care and make sure I don't uh, have my hair go everywhere because I'm a nice person and I don't like the idea of shaving with all my long hairs going down the drain. It's bad for the environment. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Alright, uh, this is already going fun, isn't it? Maybe I should do another review and just continually do more reviews while I'm uh, shaving. I could, but that would look really weird and bad. Uh, and I don't really want to, because I want to do this and shave and shower and get back to filming reviews later, because I actually have stuff other than this to do today, and I've got... I've got time. I've still got time, and i got to get, get, get this done. Yeah. Oh my god, there's so much hair. I will be honest, for someone like me who doesn't actually stylize his own hair, you know, like... When it comes to my... Like... I mean, the only time I've really ever stylized my hair, like say the top of my head, was back in primary school when we had a... I think it was like a... You know, crazy hair day kind of thing, you know. Two dollar donation, crazy hair, I put a lot of gel and made it blue and um, it was just like there was one big spike in the middle and everything else was just kind of itsy bitsy, it was really really bad. Like you expect those kind of 90s overly gelled hairdos where it's just pointy hair everywhere and uh, no, um, it was worse. <laughs> Uh, and as you can tell, I'm not very great at shaving, um, in terms of, I mean, look, it takes a while to shave the, uh, perfect beard, if you will, and this is not the perfect beard, in fact, this is pretty, good. this is very Spock from, um, what do you call it, uh, Two Mirrors or whatever, that episode where there's just two versions of them all. Yeah. I will say, given how notable it is, uh, I don't plan to shave the whole beard because, like, clean shave. Don't go clean shaving very often. In fact, uh, I don't want to go clean shaving because I work in a very cold environment, so the idea of doing that is uh, very bad uh, because it becomes very cold, in fact. And I do not like my face becoming cold.
cold. Yes, I'm going to Snapchat this now. Going to brag about it. I'm going to be growing this thing for a month and a half now. I know, it's nothing spectacular. It's a beard. Oh my god, every guy has one. Not every guy. I know a few, few people who don't. Does it look bad? I mean, like, I know, I don't really get many close-ups of it. The crazy beard was fun, but, uh, you know, I used to, in high school, be like, yeah, I gotta, you know, really emphasize the shaving business of it. I wanna, wanna make myself look stylized, I guess you could say. Uh, it's, it's not really something I do. Um, like, it's either full beard or no beard, pretty much. That's just, that's just how it is. I don't know what I'll do with the sideburns yet. I might not decide on that today. I might do that later. Um, cool. Which one should we talk about next? <laughs> I don't even know. Um, da -da 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 -da. Let's talk about... Oh, yeah. Um... No, I think we'll go Ghost Rider. Ghost Rider? That sounds cool, right? Ghost Rider's a cool film. Ghost Rider's a 2007 film. Uh, I should mention, Peter Fonda was in it uh, as, I thought, the devil, but no, there's another dude by the name Statham of S, but he's pretty much the devil. Um, and uh, he passed away today. Uh, so, yes, I'm dating this video incredibly, but it is very coincidental that yesterday, as in last night, I watched the film for my review, and today he has he, he's passed away, which is very sad. Uh, good actor. Uh, I don't think I'll do a review of his films, but I'm just, I'm just, yeah. Anyway, uh, Ghost Rider. My quote for the film is, uh, Human sacrifice makes me uncomfortable. Notable in terms of the fact that, uh, that kind of happens uh, the year before when he did uh, the, the, the Wicker Man film, which was atrocious. Yeah, Wicker Man, that was a great film. Gonna get to that in a minute soon, promise. Um, so what can I say? Uh, there are some pretty decent special effects. I mean, you know, some of them are good, some of them bad. It's 2007. It's not a big budget, it's big enough. Oh boy, but it looks... I mean, look, there are some parts that look really ugly. Um... So yeah, uh, so pretty decent special effects, a fun character performance for Cage because there are elements of him where he's very fun and very crazy. Um, and some very atrocious head editing and uses of slow motion. Uh, and this, of course, all resonates in 2007's Ghost Rider, directed by some weirdo. Um, all I can really say is that I did like this film when it came out, uh, when I was like, you know, nine or ten years old. Um, actually, I think I was younger than that, but I think I watched it when I was nine or ten. I got the DVD. Came in a collector's edition trilogy pack with um, The Punisher featuring John Travolta and what was that other film? I think it's very famous. Uh, Hellboy. Only one pack. It's very strange. Either way, I think my brother was like, yeah, I think this is Sam. It was like, yeah, Ghost Rider's cool. Let's, let's buy this DVD pack. So we got the DVD pack. Yay. I don't mind. I've never watched The Punisher. Um, yeah, so uh, also, shout out to it being, sh also shout out to it being filmed in, of all places, Melbourne, Australia, where I'm from. Which is very strange. Um, I'm very, like, I recognize the shot and I've been like, that looks a lot like, you know, um, a, a metro train, you know, a, tra a train from my train line. Um, and it looks like, you know, uh, this. it looks like the city that I live in. But I'm like, nah, it can't be. Got to the end of the credits and it said, filmed in Melbourne, Australia. And I'm like, oh my god, how did I not realise that completely? Especially the very, the obvious Docklands shot when he's on the bridge thingy. I'm kind of dumb, aren't I? Um... So yes, of course, it took me 12 years to realise that, but then I have friends who were like, dude, how did you not know that? Uh, Guy, for example, found it very uh, fun to watch it because he was like, oh, I know those places. I live there. Good shit. Um, watch the plot. Uh, it was very hot. Oh, crap. Um, I'm in a lot of sunlight right now. 
So uh, Cage is Johnny Blaze, uh, not the one from Fantastic Four. Um, he makes a deal with the devil, uh, then he when he actually becomes Cage, so you know, this young version dude, whatever, when he becomes Nicolas Cage after making a deal with the devil, uh, he turns into the Ghost Rider and has to stop Wes Bentley from looking creepy. Um, unfortunately, you can't stop that. Wes Bentley will always look creepy, uh, no matter what CGI you use. Um, or practical effects. Um, also, there's a romantic subplot, uh, subplot with Eva Mendes. Uh, I just there. Because every superhero film must have a love interest, even if she's pretty much two-dimensional and does nothing. Um, so it's a fast-paced film, which kind of surprised me, given that the first 20 minutes, which is his whole origin, is very... Slow paced, dramatic, you know, let you breathe, let you get into the world. Um, and then suddenly, when he's caged, it's just boom, done. Oh my god, something's happened. Okay, we're done. That was the film. What the hell was that? I'd say it's a wild ride, but let's be honest, it's okay. Um, uh, yeah, I really feel like it needed kind of more breathing room for like Cage to kind of like understand himself as the Ghost Rider and stuff like that, and even for you to understand Cage as a character. Um, there is some kind of an extended edition. I don't, I didn't have that edition. I just had a regular theatrical cut, which was like 10 minutes shorter. Um, but at the same time, this also is like a mid 2000s superhero film that doesn't know what meaning is. So, you know, if, unless it's a goofy romp that is Sam Raimi's Spider-Man trilogy, an excellent trilogy, or it's, I guess, X-Men, but we don't talk about X-Men anymore. Um, but of course this is the year before the MCU started, so, you know, you're not allowed to have meaning, you're not allowed to be artsy or cool or actually, you know, decent, I guess, um, um, and let's not talk about the sequel, um, I'm not watching Spirit of Vengeance, I'm not doing that to myself, I don't think anyone wants to do that to themselves, Ghost Rider is a fun film and dumb, and I gave it three stars for its overall funness, like, it's just a dude on a motorbike who turns into a fire skeleton and beats up, you know, demons and shit. That's cool. It's like Constantine, if Constantine actually was interesting in the film, but didn't have good performances or even mediocre performances uh, or good cinematography or effects. Like, Constantine is actually much better in the cinematography performances and uh, effects department, whereas... Uh, it's really bad in terms of narrative, pacing, everything like that. Ghost Rider isn't, I mean, it's not like the, a masterpiece of storytelling either, but like, it's at least uh, entertaining, it's fast paced, it just, once it starts, it's done before you know it, you know. Constantine needed that, it needed that kind of treatment. It just didn't have it, which sucks. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but of course, we're all here for Cage's performance. Uh, yeah, it's alright. I mean, look, in some scenes, especially when he's turning into the Ghost Rider, he's cro he goes crazy, and it's great, it's fun. Uh, it's totally worth watching the film for. Um, but outside of that, he seems kind of asleep during it. He's just like, he's just there, and he likes the character. He has a bad haircut, very, very black hair. And it's just, he's just there, reciting the lines. Not really doing much. His character doesn't have much to him. He even feels pretty two-dimensional. Oh, he's a motorcyclist, but he's running away from the devil. It's not very three-dimensional, really, when you think about it. Um, so, yeah. Uh, he's not boring, but he's not, you know, stupidly funny either. So, you know, take that as you will. Um, outside of that, that's all I can really say about this film. It's... It's fun enough, I guess. So yeah, I guess if you haven't watched Ghost Rider, check it out. It's pretty fun. I mean, you probably know who he is by this stage of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, even though he's only in the Angels of S.H.I.E.L.D. TV show, but still. Um, and it's just more fun on the, on the on, in a, as a movie. So yeah, cool. Let's get back to shaving the rest of this beard off, because as much as I like it, no one else will. They'll, if people come home being like, what the fuck are you doing, you bitch? <laughs> Oh, that's brave round in the microphone.
<laughs> hmm. So, Mandy. Um. Hmm. Oh. Um. I'm totally filming this goddamn video out of order, but I don't really care. Uh, let's take a look at my review for Mandy. What do you think of my, uh, you know, it's a few months of, uh, a few months? Wow, have I? Jesus Christ, I haven't shaved for a while, haven't I? I don't know, I'm just kind of, I'm kind of going insane, and I'm like, my mindset right now is just, whoa, out the window, which I guess is fair enough, you know, at least the cage and all. With my messy bed behind me, because I don't clean up my shit, and it's also like, almost midnight, I gotta go to uni tomorrow. Unis back, baby. So, where is it? Oh my god, Mandy, 2018 film. Uh, I don't, writ, co written and but wholeheartedly directed by Panos Cosmat, Cosmatos. Uh, yes, <laughs> uh, crazy, crazy ass film. Um, where is my review of it on Letterboxd? Go check out my Letterboxd. I do all these movies beforehand. Um, yeah, it's a crazy ass film. I gave it four and a half stars. Yeah, Panos Cosmatos. It's a uh, crazy. Um. So yeah, we all love Nicolas Cage going bonkers. It's great. Um. Ten out of ten. Would uh would uh do again. Um. What can I say about this film? I actually have two quotes. Uh, one that I just kept laughing at, which was literally just, you ripped my shirt. It's like, that's my favorite shirt. You got my shirt. Um, and the other part being, you know, you ripped my shirt. Uh, but the regular quote I used was, uh, it's all but a beautiful dream, which I think really surmises this film quite nicely. And it's like, of course it's going to be said by someone who's like, mm, partially, if not completely on some kind of LSD. Um... Yes, uh, so, uh, let's, let's talk about, uh, the film, let's talk about the film. So, um, he's a lumberjack and he don't care until you burn his wife alive and he goes on an apeshit revenge driven hunt with a crossbow and a self-made axe blade spear thingy, uh, and then chainsaws. It's pretty good. Um... Oh, so yes, Cage plays Lumberjack Red Miller, which I don't think they ever actually say his name in the film. I watched all the deleted and extended scenes, and there was nothing really in terms of actually anything being extended. It was all just deleted stuff, pretty much. Um, and there was actually a scene, like, pretty much all the deleted scenes are, like, in the first set, in the first half of the film, where, uh, where he is confronted, uh, where, like, you know, um, uh, Cage's uh, character and Mandy, so in this case, Red Miller and Mandy, uh, you know, they're chilling out, they're having their life together. It's just kind of showing how much of a couple they are. But you kind of realise that, like, all these scenes are really dialogue, kind of dialogue-heavy, but also don't really fit with the rest of the film. Um, like, it feels like they were just going for, like, some kind of 80s set uh, revenge film. And that's very obvious, because that's what it is. That's what it is. This is, this is an 80s set revenge film. But... Then they were like, hey, um, yeah, you know all these things with the dialogue that, like, actually establishes our characters and stuff? Yeah, well, we kind of visually set all that up, except for, like, this one scene where, like, it's like, oh, the Mandy's the town whore and Red Miller's the dumb lumberjack dude who's just gone somehow ended up with a thank you sheriff of somewhat town who is obviously an asshole because it's the 80s who only is in this one scene to set up those characters in expository dialogue. So, not the best written for the ex extended, the deleted scenes, uh, but that actually tells you that his name is Red Miller, which I have n I did not know, uh, and this is my second time watching the film. Um, so yes, he plays a lumberjack Red Miller who happily lives in the 80s with his wife Mandy. One day, a cult leader, Jeremiah, uh, sees her and falls for her, uh, and then continues to kidnap her and burn her alive in front of Miller because she laughs at Jeremiah's self-delusional, egotistical, religious crap. And potentially his penis. I mean, given that that was literally flashed in front of the whole audience for a while, even including him jacking himself off to make himself look better, to like really punch that egotistical stuff right in the groin. Uh, I guess there's a pun intended. Um, 
But then Cage, of course, goes fucking mental and goes on a revenge killing thing and just destroys everything. Not really. It's it's not Rambo. It's like he just kills everyone. And it's mental. Um, because, of course, this is, you know, everyone who was involved in the murder of his wife, he goes and gets revenge on, which is pretty much the, 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 the type of film. So why exactly is this film so... Mm, so why is this film something different? Why is this film considerably something worth actually talking about? Uh, well, for a few reasons. So the film has a beautiful soundtrack, uh, which is one of the most idealistic film things about it. It makes it so, seem both visually and auditorially... Auditor audibly? Audibly, sure. Uh... It makes it sound and feel like and look like a metal film. So metal being like the genre of metal music, like hardcore heavy metal shit. Which is fair enough. I mean, what's her face, Mandy? Her t-shirt is a Metallica t-shirt, you know. Um, and I mean, I'm not even into metal as a genre. Like, I probably haven't ever listened to a proper metal song. Um, but it's an interesting aesthetic. Uh, and really suits this film. So obviously they were like in post or maybe halfway throughout filming. They're like, hey, let's li really dig into this metal shit and like go completely ape shit and just kind of cut out all that stuff about them actually being real people and be more like, s you know, s spiritual and stuff like that instead. Um, you know, because they're just regular, they're just happy people. They're just doing what they do best, living together happily ignoring all of their past and focusing completely on their future together. Um, so the soundtrack is uh, conducted by Johan Johansson, who uh, actually passed away, uh, I think, just, be just before the release of this film, uh, which sucks because he I really liked his soundtracks. He's, I mean, a lot of people did, let's be honest there. Um, so additionally, you've got a stellar visuals on part with uh, Suspiria from 1977, um, Probably not good, uh, not as fantastical in terms of the uh, locations. I mean, the ones that they actually designed themselves, yeah, no, that makes sense. Definitely, it looks amazing. The rest of it's like, oh, look, it's forests and, like, a house and just kind of random stuff. Um, so it's not... Production design isn't fantastical uh, in, the, in the majority of the film, but then... They make it look visually great through the cinematography, and then there's the latter half of the film has a lot of really cool looking places and shit. Um, the acting is mental, especially from Cage. Uh, the actress who plays Mandy as well is quite exceptional. Uh, who, what is her name? I quite like, so that's uh, Andrea Riseborough? Uh, Riseborough? Yeah, that sounds, sounds about right, yeah. Um, she's great as Mandy. Um, very kind of nonchalant and laid back and just kind of. Again, just kind of like mellow. I guess mellow, yeah, is the right word for it. Uh, Linus Roach, who plays Jeremiah Sands, the cult leader, is fucking mental. Uh, and I love it. He, he really commits to the performance. Um, Cage, that's who we're here for. Cage is uh, subtle and uh, calm in the first half. Uh, before he watches Mandy burn to death. Yeah, spoilers. Uh, burn to death. You can't talk about this film without talking about the second half, which is the whole cage half. The first half is Mandy and has him in the bit being like, oh, he's a lumberjack, uh, he loves his wife, and uh, that's pretty much it. He hardly says anything, he hardly does anything, voila. Um, and, you know, he appreciates his uh, wife's art, and that's pretty much it. But then, you know, this post, this traumatic event, he goes mental, the first scene pretty much of him breaking out of his handcuffs and everything. He gets home in his underwear, and he just, after watching a really weird commercial, he just goes into the bathroom and just starts screaming and wailing. He sits in the toilet, he's got a bottle of vodka, and he's just fucking slamming that shit down his throat, and it's just like, holy crap, okay then. Yeah, it's happening. Um, yeah, so, you know, from his breakdown on the toilet, uh... Then, oh my god, um, so from his breakdown on the toilet to his many, many fight scenes, including one that's very, uh, vicious and, uh, involves not just one, but, uh, two chainsaws, mm -hmm. very nice, um, is his prefer, is his performance worth watching this film for? Like, you know, given the fact that he goes ape shit, given the fact that he's amazing, and the fact that, you know, it's fucking cool, 
Yes. His performance is worth watching this film for. Obviously. Um, but then let's think about the rest of it. So is the atmosphere of the film or the collective performances or the musical, the visuals, uh, worth watching the film for? Ah, uh, yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, no, this film is definitely worth watching in terms of every aspect. Yes, it's slow. Trust me. I think watching it the second time, I much, much prefer... Like, I liked it the first time. I was like... That was an experience and a half. The second time I watched it, I'm like, you know what? Uh, yeah, that's actually even better. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's not really much to talk about plot-wise. They're in love. Cold leader sees Mandy. Mandy gets killed. Cage goes on a mad fucking rampage, killing everyone, and it's great. Um... Have you seen Mandy yet? Because you, you should. Um, it's good. I gave it four and a half stars. Uh, definitely worth it. Definitely worth the watch. Four and a half. Everything's great. Cage actually plays. It's just great in it. I think the deleted scenes actually kind of shows that he, yeah, he may not have been fully committed. Um, but then he definitely is in a rampaging crazy scenes, which is probably why they cut out the other stuff, which is fair enough. Um, so it's slow, but it's a, worth the trip. Um, I also have a theory that I kind of want to discuss, you know, it's kind of weird. Uh, so there's actually a moment just before Mandy gets burned to death where, uh, Cage's character actually gets stabbed, uh, in the side, in the gut, uh, by a pretty big blade and it's pretty significantly shown on screen with the green flashing lights giving you a fucking aneurysm and being like, why is this so important? And my theory is that he actually dies. This stab wound actually kills him. Uh, you know, the cult leaders go, uh, and then he dies because he's tied up and he's bled out from the guts. Um, and, you know, this, this blade, this stab wound, is never mentioned again. This is why I find it's important. Um, so in my mind, uh, this actually becomes a spiritual revenge journey. This isn't like the spiritual is metaphorical. This is in his spirit of comes out of his body, and is like, you know what, fuck this, kind of takes more of a physical form to be kind of pretty much invulnerable, which makes sense given all the shit he gets dealt physically, um, I mean, not just emotionally, like, physically, he gets really, really hurt, um, and he, yeah, so in other words, his spirit becomes its own entity, plows vengeance on those who did wrong to Mandy. Yes, I'm trying to say he becomes the spirit of vengeance. No, I'm not watching Ghost Rider 2. That's all I'm saying. Um, yeah, so that's kind of just my theory about it. And it, it makes sense. I mean, the spiritual, really kooky visuals and all that really kind of adds to it. Plus, like, the final scene of him... Just not just going, not just looking apeshit crazy, but also being like, he's like, he's happy. He's like, I'm finally done. My vengeance is done. He looks, and Mandy's there in the car with him. And it's kind of like her spirit is being like there to say, thank you for doing this. You're great. I love you. Let's go live in uh, our dream world together. And then they drive, he drives away, uh, and you get these planets above him. And it's like, what the crap? Why is there planets and stuff? Because this is the story that she was going to read in earlier. So it's like they're now in their paradise, uh, which is this fictional world that she would live in. And he's just there because he loves her and she loves him. And that makes sense. And also the fact that uh, she also had a, there's like the last shot of the film post credits is like, uh, she's have had, she's drawn all this stuff, and one of them includes the tiger that's in the film later, and like emerging as like the spirit animal of Cage, um, which I guess is obviously relevant, but I think it kind of emphasizes that factor of either this whole entire f story is fictional and she's made it up, or she's actually died and it's his spirit has come to take vengeance. So yeah, four out of uh, four and a half stars out of five. Go watch Mandy. Uh, I'm going to go to bed now because it's late and uh, i got to get rid of this uh, and then watch more films. Uh, yeah, I hate this.
for now. As as the process goes, you know, you, you, sh you shave it all off to get to this length and you're like, okay, it could still be, you know, need some fine tuning as it goes. But what I'll do first is I'll have a shower, clean myself off, see how it looks. Um, and if there's anything left to do, I don't know if there's anything left to do. And then we will continue the reviews. A lot of reviews. <sighs> I can feel my sanity coming back to me. Yeah. Cool. Hmm. Okay, this is a little uh, unprofessionally shot. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, so, um... I just watched this uh, lovely little feature. You might you might have heard about it. It's called uh, the Wicker Man. Uh, might, don't mind the weekly horror horror crap. Horror, yeah, fucking lie much. Jesus fuck. Australian version. Apparently, apparently there's an unrated cut, which is genius given how this is only rated fucking M. And it includes the most famous scene where he has the bees get put on his fucking face. But no, they decided not to put it in this one. It's the theatrical cut. Apparently. Yet nobody, nobody's talked about it. Except for like one little trivia thing on fucking IMDB saying, In the uncut scene there's an extra little thing where they break his legs and put the bees on his face. The most iconic scene in the fucking film isn't on the film. What the fuck? What the fuck, movie? What are you doing? You're doing it wrong, you shit. Oh, I'm so angry at this fucking movie. I mean, yes, in, in, in fairness, it, I bought it for four fucking dollars. But holy shit! Why do I not have a hammer right now? Oh, who gives a fuck? Cooper, save me. Save me, please. I hate this. I hate this. Please save me. Boo. Did I scare you? I hope I did. Because this is the scariest movie on this list. That's right. It's The Wicker Man from... 2006. So. I fucking hate this movie. You know how there are a lot of movies where they're like, oh, it's so bad, it's good, you know, The Room, or later in this list, Vampire's Kiss, you know, shit like that. Well, this one isn't funny. Well, I mean, look, it is partially funny in two moments, really, pretty much in the last 25 minutes when he punches that lady and then screams at that other lady and then dresses up as a bear and punches that other lady. But in that, if it asks, it's funny. You might be confused. Let me get to it. Um, actually, I probably don't need to because I probably already included the clip before this. Uh, yeah, so, uh, the version I had didn't include the most famous scene and pretty much pivotal scene that wraps up all of the ideology and stuff that's presented in the film. All of the thematics, everything collides in one scene, not the bees. It wasn't in the film. So as you saw, I kind of got a bit angry at it. Um, yeah. So let's talk about the film. So Cage gets scared in the film more than I did. Actually, I never got scared once. That's the problem of this film. It's a horror and it's not scary. What the fuck? Like, this isn't like some kind of like, you know, Frankenstein or RKO horror where it's like, oh, it's not scary because it was made 60, 80 years ago and it's not scary because culture has changed circa... 1979, we've alien scared the bejesus out of everyone, and has been doing so ever since. But then, like, something like Frankenstein, or, you know, even the, even cat people from 1942, that shit ain't scary. But, I mean, it probably could be if you are really young and dumb, I guess, you know, children. But, like, you know, like, you know, modern audiences don't get scared by that shit anymore. Um, this film isn't scary. Personally, I don't think the uh, original one is either. The original Wicker Man from, like, the 70s, maybe the 80s. I think it's a 78 film, I can't remember. Um, either way, that film didn't scare me either, but that film had a presence of horror. A very obvious presence of horror through atmosphere. This one doesn't even manage that. This one is a bundle of confusion and rage all in one. And that's just from the audience perspective. And the narrative, and the editing. <coughs> <coughs> mm. 
and the writing and directing. Um, and the narrative and the editing and the writing and directing. It's just, uh So, it's just all dry. The only thing that's good, I'd argue, is the music. And that's mostly because I really like Angelo Badalamenti because he did a lot of the David Lynch stuff. I'm like, really? Why'd you have to do this? But then at the same time, he was probably like, oh, The Wicker Man, yeah, I know that film. Oh, oh of course I'll do the, the music for it. He was probably watching the film whilst doing the music for it and being like, oh, no. <laughs> what have I done? Um, you know, it's good, good composer, bad movie. Um, the film is exceptionally dry. The acting, the directing, the writing, the editing especially. Oh, my God, this, this film could have... Ironically, have a short of uh, short, have, bleh, bleh. this film. Ironically, could have had a shorter runtime. I say ironically because I was watching the theatrical cut. Apparently, there is a difference between the theatrical and uncut. A version I did not know even existed. It's hard enough to find this film as it is, and I got the fucking DVD, the Australian DVD for four fucking dollars, and I could yeah, last one in Australia, kind of thing, you know, on eBay. Could didn't know that there was an uncut version. No one said anything about it. Of course, you don't want to look up spoilers, but then if you look up the IMDb trivia thing, not even trivia, just says like, you know, specs or something about it, it actually tells you that there is this extra scene. Fucking idiots. Um, so yes, it's like the writer-director saw the original, wanted to make an American, which is really weird because all the, all the accents just don't collate and it's really fucking weird. Um... And added a feminist theme with the whole island full of women and bee collective metaphor, but forgot how horror worked in terms of tone. Now, I like the feminist edition. Like, at least the remake isn't shot-for-shot shot kind of remake. This isn't the remake of Psycho. Fuck if I remember who goddamn directed it. But it's not that. And I like the feminist theme. It, it, the theme, it works, the whole collective thing. They even really emphasize it and... Go into detail about it. Be like, yeah, 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 no, yeah, like, like, we don't need men. We use them to procreate, and then like they go on their way, kind of thing. And the only men that are on the island are doing kind of manual labor, and they can't even speak. The um, I guess the obvious thing is like, oh, they had all their tongues removed because they're men, but they you never see it. They never actually speculate it or state it as a matter of fact. He runs into one room. There's a bunch of men there during the festival. And they're just sitting there doing nothing, even though there are men very clearly there during the festival. They're just sitting in the bar, and he's like, I need your help. You need to help me. He runs over the line from, get up. Why won't you talk to me? And then he runs away. The guys just sit there like. I did like the bee metaphor, though. The, the whole thing of the bee you near know, the hive mind thing and how society works and whatever. And it all works really well. It's very on the nose, very obvious stuff. You know, it's not incredibly subtle or intelligent. It's very much there. The problem is, is that by removing the not the bees scene, as funny and dumb as it is, and yeah, I watched it on my phone because, of course, I can still watch it. It's on fucking YouTube. It's three minutes that they cut out, and you watch it, and you're like, none of this is graphic. Why did you cut this out? Like, yeah, they break his legs. The sounds of it is it's gra graphic. They break his legs, then they torture him with bees, and he has an allergic reaction, then they bring him back to life with an adrenaline shot, and then they tie him up in, into a blanket and, you know drag him along and burn him alive. However, the dragging along and burning alive is still there in the version I watched. Just while they're dragging him along, you don't even know where he is, it's just a wide shot of a bunch of people walking towards the Wicker Man, and you just have all this, uh, this audio over the top of him being like, this is murder, this is murder, you're not gonna get away with this, this is murder, and then suddenly it's a close-up and they've just, they're, now they're unwrapping him and he's got all these bee stings on him and you're like, Wait, what happened? Why couldn't he walk? What, what's with all the bee stings? Now, of course, someone like me, who's uh, knows their fair share of fucking memes, uh, yet yeah, I know, of course, that I had missed the scene, because I'm watching it, and the scene where it should have been wasn't there. And I was confused, because suddenly I can see the Wicked Man, and I'm thinking, nah, they, they, they can't have skipped the scene. They wouldn't have done this to me. I wouldn't have infested all this time just to not see the one scene I came to see, and it wasn't there. Oh. 
I guess back to the horror elements. Um, there are a bunch of dumb jump scares, especially in the constant dream sequences that are usually the same dream. It's the same dream, just remade over and over again. And apparently it's spooky! Oh look, this girl is alive! Boom! Explosion! Now she's dead, but no, she's alive! And now she's a different girl! But now, wait for it, she's bees. Ho! Huh. Ho! Huh. But like the whole factor of the bees thing is the fact that he is allergic to them. But also it's like their society needs the bees and like they need this wicked man to fucking sacrifice so they can get their honey back so they can start actually doing stuff. So they look alright, you know, like, they're like, oh last year's crop was the worst harvest. And yet he walks into a room full of potatoes and shit and everything looks fine. And everyone seems how happy and healthy. They really didn't do much to convey the fact that they really need this sacrifice to happen. At least in the original, it kind of seemed like they did, but they weren't... The idea was that they weren't desperate for it because you didn't want it to make it so obvious that he was here for the ritual. Because if you emphasize the ritual over the, the mystery of the girl, then... It would completely ruin it. It would ruin, like, it, you know, he's, he would be like... Why are you guys so, like, overly obsessed with this ritual stuff? Something that he's trying to blatantly ignore because he's trying to find this girl because he finds that more important than some culture's rituals because he's an ignorant prick. Um, and, you know, if you if they emphasize it too much, then he would really be like, okay, there is something up with this ritual. It may or may not relate to this girl, but it may actually relate to me. And he'd probably put two and two together, him being a detective and shit, and be like, eh, they've brought me here to kill me. To reinstate their crops. So he kind of gets the idea that later in the film that they may have sacrificed the girl to do for the crops because um, they suggest another fucking ritual thing. I don't know. It's not important. The the whole none of it makes any sense. Like it's just so poorly done. Like at least in the original, when they had the they you know they got to the actual sacrifice, they're like, yes, now our crops will work and whatever. Even he's even though he's saying it won't work. You know, I don't believe in your you know, rituals, and they won't come to fruition, but that's not the idea. The idea is the fact that they actually succeed and they burn him alive. And then it's like, oh, well, their ritual may happen, it may reinstate itself, but it doesn't matter. You're so invested in the characters and the idea and the horror of the island being like, holy shit, this actually could exist. But then in the 2006 version, you're just like, damn, this is so poorly acted and so poorly directed and written and everything. It's atrocious. But I feel overly insulted by this film. Um, I bought this film for four dollars. I know not that much, uh, and it didn't even come with the famous, not the B scene. And uh, you know, apparently, of course, extended cut. Fucking. All right, let's talk about Cage's performance. Who cares? Okay, he's an arrogant douche for the whole fucking film. And even in the films where he gets really overly insulting and being like, you know. Why, why would you let him do this? Why you? you know, he just, he just goes mental and it's like, yeah, it's funny when he does the not the B scene. But at the same time, I mean, it kind of just shows of how kind of, I mean, inherently kind of like sexist the dude is. Like, I mean, maybe it's just because it's an island full of women. But at the same time, like, he's expecting more from the men. It's just, who cares? Um, I gave this film half a star because it fucking sucks. Uh, I wouldn't even recommend it as a so bad it's good. I mean, yeah, sure, if you can get the uncut version, fucking go for it. But honestly, the only notable scenes that are actually even worth watching for the whole film that aren't boring is the scene where he punches one woman who has the bear costume, he yells at the other woman who's helping him, his ex, his ex fiance, um, and then he dresses up as a bear and punches the, you know, punches the woman to kidnap the kid, and then the bees. Scenes, you know, four notable scenes easily available on YouTube. Don't bother yourself with this piece of trash. <sighs> okay, let's talk about another film. So, let's talk about Wild at Heart. Um, it was fun to rewatch this film. I've seen this film three times now. I think I watched it. First time in theatre at the Astor last year uh, for the David Lynch Marathon. Um, 
Uh, then I watched it again when I got the Blu-ray, and now I've watched it a third time on the Blu-ray for this review. Um, what can I say? It's it's a David Lynch film, so it makes it just more fun for me, because he's my favourite director. Um, my quote, of course. Uh, did I ever tell you that, uh, that this here jacket represents a symbol of my individuality and my belief in personal freedom? Here's a leather skin jacket. Uh, it's like a snake skin jacket. Um... So, I don't have much to say about this film. Nicolas Cage is my oldest. Um, it means a lot to me, of course. Riverino. Um, Cage plays Sailor Ripley uh, alongside Laura Dern as Lula Pace Fortune. That is her name, Lula Pace Fortune. Uh, together, they like to high kick the air, wear very distinctive clothing, and have a lot of sex. Uh, also, they like to reference The Wizard of Oz, but, you know, that's just subtext, really, you know. Uh, Four-star film. Cage is ridiculously amazing in this film. This is the second earliest film I've... Oh, third earliest. Moonstrike's my earliest film I've ever watched of his, and probably his earliest, most famous. Um, no, Moonstrike is not on this list. Um, there's not really much... Like, look... It's a David Lynch film, so you can't really... I can't really suggest you go into it for Cage. Even though he is the main character, and even... He's great in it, too. Him and uh, Laura Dern are fantastic. All the performances are really fun, especially uh, Willem Dafoe, who comes in at the latter half of the film, and he's just so <laughs> fucking weird and creepy, and I love it. Um, but it's also... It's a David Lynch film, so you've got to have... I feel like you'd need the context of, like, you know, he, he's it's adapted from a book, but he's uh, emphasising the dark underbelly values of Americana. Uh, you've got this kind of... It feels, like, out of time and out of place, like most David Lynch stuff does. Like, the, the, the mother feels like she lives in the 50s, whereas, you know, Lula and Sailor live in the 80s. You know, they're, they're, they're having fun. They're doing what they want to do. They're kids. They're young. Let them... Um, yes, there are a lot of sex scenes in this film, uh, I, yeah, they're not bad, uh, worth noting, I guess, um, so that's, it's a lot of graphic content, there's graph, uh, there's, you know, there's, you got your murder, you got your violence, you got your sex and your drugs, um, it's probably his darkest film behind, uh, next to, uh, Twin Peaks Fire Walk With Me, which I think is his actual darkest film, um, not just in terms of themes, but in terms of the presentation of these themes, like, there are a lot of films he did in the 90s, which are, like, Lost Highway, uh, uh, which have sex and violence and drugs, um, but it's not as, uh, detailed as it is in Wild at Heart, and definitely not as detailed as it is in Fire Walk With Me, which is probably his most, his darkest film, um, but yeah, uh, Cage is is really fun in this film. He's he's so lively and courageous, and always just just he's crazy but fun. Like he's like not dumb crazy. He's actually like he's a character. He's actually got dimension to himself. Yes, there are the very goofy lines where you know he g g talks about his jacket and the fact that you know it's a representation of his individuality or. He uh, beats people up because they, you know, try to be overly sexual or whatever with Lula or insult her. You know, there there is a lot of the metaphor of the Wizard of Oz stuff. It's There's a lot to this film. Um, and honestly, I would really recommend this. I gave it four out of five stars. Uh, it's very weird to watch. To rewatch. I don't think it has too much value rewatching. I mean, unless you really like to see the sex scenes, but like... It's also, like, it's really fun to see Nicolas Cage pretty much play a version of Elvis. Um, and it's just, it's just a lot of fun. Um, it's quite a wild ride. Uh, and very classic, has very iconic moments. Um, very weird and crazy and creepy and scary characters. Um, but totally worth the ride. Uh, so yes, I'd highly suggest watching uh, Wild at Heart. Uh, and last but not least, we have um, Vampire's Kiss, which is the earliest film I was able to get my hands on, uh, and is quite <sighs> so fun. I'm a vampire! 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 Um... Vampire's Kiss 
is a 1988 film, the one he did the year after uh, Moonstruck, uh, which is the one where he has sex with Sher. It's notable for it's notable for only that reason, totally just for that reason, of course. What between his a good acting and drama and um, good directing and stuff, it's, I don't know. Uh, so uh, my favorite line, which is a lot of people's favorite line, let's be honest, is uh, "My girlfriend broke up with me. I'm a vampire. Kill me. Kill me." Um, I, I had such a fun time watching this last night. I watched it literally at uni. I was like waiting for two hours to for to meet up with my girlfriend and. I was like, I'm going to watch this film on my laptop because f- bugger YouTube, I want to watch this film. Uh, and my friend uh, Lachlan had given me a copy of it. Um, and, oh my god. Like, you you hear it being like, you know, so bad it's good or like a cult classic cult uh, level film or whatever. Um, and it's very weird. The first ten minutes in particular is just like, you get the establishment that Nicolas Cage, who plays uh, Peter Lowe, he is, he's a white-collar businessman, not a very attractive idea of a character, of course, uh, who has a lot of sexual encounters. Um, like Literally, the first three minutes is he has a sexual encounter with one girl, and before he's able to actually have, have sex with her, a bat just is in his room, and they, he fights it off, and then they both just run away drunk laughing. And the acting is very weird. But, like, you get a straightaway example of how crazy Cage is in this film because he has this British accent. Even though he even admits later in the film that he's, like, from... He's still from America. Like, he was born and raised in America. He's never been to any other country. And so you get this idea, like, okay, so he's putting this voice on and this act on to strangers, especially to to women, to, you know, to coerce them to sleep with him. Um, Because... He likes to seem better than others. Um, you know, he has a high-paying job. He has an apartment in New York. Um, and that's the whole point. Um, so, like, you have to get behind that first. Because I was, like, watching being like, this is so bad. And, like, the pacing and everything about the first ten minutes alone, I just don't know. It's not a very attractive first ten minutes. But he sleeps with one woman, then suddenly he meets another girl at a bar, and he sleeps with her, and it turns out that she's a vampire. Um, and she sucks some of his blood, and then it's like, suddenly he now thinks he's a vampire. It's not straight away, he's like, I'm a vampire, I'm a vampire, you know. It's, slowly he's come, becoming more and more insane, and becoming more and more thinking that, like, he's allergic to daylight, or that, you know, Christianity and the cross is bad for him and all this kind of stuff, and it's hilarious. Um, so, yeah, this film is such a absolute bewilderment that I feel like I'm... There is a scene where he goes to his apartment and there are two mimes. One, uh, they're both having a dance, one slaps the other one, and then the one who uh, who gets slapped... Uh, uh, the one, yeah, so... The, I think there's a male and a female. The male slaps the female, and the female spits on the male. And I feel like, when I was watching this film, that I was both of these people. I feel like I've just been slapped and spat on, confused within all context, because they're just there for no reason, just street performers, because I guess it's New York, I guess that's what happens. Um, and it's just, just so random and crazy. So it's not the fact of being spat and slapped. It's the fact... Um, it's the fact that... The context is weirder than the actual actions taking place. Um, so we, the audience, are this old lady that's in the bathroom once Nicholas Cage has uh, chased one of his uh, one of his employees into the female bathroom, um, who just who comes out of the stalls and just in general is just like, what the fuck is going on? And then walks looks right at the camera and then just keeps walking. That's who I feel we are. That's just. Um, so yeah, this film is honestly such a strange, uh, it's so fucking strange, and, but it's, like, all on purpose, and I love it for that reason, like, yeah, I w- looked at the IMDb after watching the film, after just being so amazed by what the hell I've just watched, and they were just like, yeah, no, it's Nicolas Cage's favourite film that he's ever been in, and they even, like, the, I think the director or writer had said, like, it was purposely made this way, it was purposely made to be this kind of goofball film. Because apparently it's a black comedy. Like, on, you know, you look it up on Google, it just says drama horror. It's a black comedy. 
It's not a horror. Yeah, it's got a vampire, but it's not scary, so it's not a horror. And it's dramatic, but it's not really dramatic. Like, it's a black comedy for sure. Um, so yeah, Cage plays Peter Lowe. He's a white core businessman who, after a sexual encounter with a vampire, suddenly believes that he has become a vampire because of it. Uh, he is an American who fakes a British accent to appear more high, uh, to appear more high class. And oh boy, his accent is fun. Um, his expressions, facial expressions, and even vocal expressions, so all body expressions, everything about him is so all over the place, and it's great. There's a one, one of the, you know, you've got the meme with him going like, yes! Um, you've got the, uh, I, I never misplaced one file, not one file, and like, just all these great scenes that are just intercut throughout the whole thing, and you're just like, what the fuck is going on? Um, and it's so great. Uh, it, fuck, okay, what's the plot? Um, he thinks he's a, he thinks he's a vampire and continues to harass an employee and stalk women at night, uh, before completely losing his mind and wanting to die. Hence the, uh, chosen quote. He runs up to a bunch of strangers, because this is filmed, like, wide lens camera, so from a distance, him reenacting all these lines and stuff of just random people walking past him being like, what the fuck is this guy's problem? Again, not... Completely famous household name, Nicolas Cage. This isn't Con Air Nick Cage yet. Um, um, and it's so fun. It is so fucking fun. Um, and honestly, his performance is golden. Like, uh, he is why you watch this film. You don't watch it for the narrative, for the directing, for anything else. Not even for the fucking er eroticism based from that comes from the vampires or him just having sex with women at night. Um... You know, you, you're not there for that. You're there for Cage and Cage alone. Uh, everyone else kind of takes this film... like Their performances are more serious. Um, especially the girl who plays Elsa or... Uh, Ezra? I think it's Ezra. But yeah, pretty much everyone else... Most of the people are taking their role seriously. Um, you know, they're, they're not making it seem... They're not goofing up their appearances to make it seem more like a black comedy. It's just him and him alone. Um, but would I recommend this film? Overall, and or be all, yes, wholeheartedly. Uh, I gave this film a 4 out of 5 stars. Um, do yourself a favour, find a copy, uh, and have a fun night, either with mates or by yourself. Um, and just kind of, just, just embrace the absurdity that is Cage in this performance. Uh, what else can I say? It's, it's incredible. Um, and that's where we end this video. Um, yes, it's been a wild ride. I have gained my sanity back, uh, which is nice. Um, next act up, I think I'm going to do, I think I'm going to stick to those seven films, uh, only videos, um, which we kind of did this part. We did, uh, the two-parter with... Nicolas Cage, seven videos in the previous one. It was going to be seven videos and seven films in this one, but I just couldn't be bothered watching the seventh one. Um, and so we got six films in this one instead, uh, which I think was a good trade-off. I, was, I originally was going to watch the other film instead of Vampire's Kiss, but then found Vampire's Kiss, and I'm very happy about that. Um, I will do more reviews like this in the future, of course. Uh, there are plenty more to come. There are plenty more in the past. And as playlists will appear on screen at some stage uh, where I've done, who have I reviewed? Cara Delevingne, Dakota Johnson, uh, Aubrey Plaza, uh, Keanu Reeves in two parts, now Nicolas Cage in two parts, and Masami Nagasawa for my Japan special. Um, thank you for everyone who's been watching these videos so far. It's really quite a joy to make, because it's like, I love reviewing films and watching films, and then to be able to collaborate them with some kind of a weird narrative, it's just sound, it's, it feels more creative and feels more earned and worth it. Um, so yes, uh, thank you all so much for watching. Feel free to like, share, and subscribe for more, and, f and check out more videos. If you want, if you want to suggest an actor, uh, go for it. My next current actor that I'm planning on doing is Johnny Depp. Um, I want to do two of his classics, uh, and then... The next five are going to be, one or two will be decent, the rest will be atrocious. Uh, this could be, like, atrocious because the films are absolutely horrible, or because it's, like, audience or critic consensus says bad. Um, so, yeah, uh, stay tuned for that in the coming month or so. Again, th these are usually come out once a month. 
but uh, I've had a bit of a change up with my schedule because of just I got so tired after Japan. Um, so yeah, let's uh, let's uh, let's continue on. I'll see you next time. Bye. Why do I not have a hammer right now?